Good evening. Three minutes past nine on LBC. Um, it's very rare that any transport-related announcement gets almost universal acclaim from the sector that it's addressing, particularly when that sector is, is cycling. Um, but as you can imagine, I'm a regular reader of Cycling Weekly. I've been looking at their website, and they, they say that more or less everyone in the cycling sector thinks that this uh, announcement today, the cycling strategy, which it was announced um, a few months ago, to be fair. This isn't a new two billion. The two billion was announced, I think, back in May, and Boris Johnson actually launched the strategy today. Now, they intend building thousands of miles of protected cycle routes in towns and cities. They want to set a higher standard for cycling in infrastructure to be overseen by a new inspectorate, oh my god, and improving the national cycle network. They want to boost investment by creating a long-term cycling programme and budget to guarantee a flow of funding, make the streets safer by strengthening the highway code to protect cyclists and pedestrians, legal protections for vulnerable road users, raising safety standards and lorries, and working with the police and retailers to tackle bike theft, helping local authorities to crack down on traffic of traffic offences, increasing the powers of metro mayors over key road networks, creating more low traffic neighbourhoods to improve air quality and reduce traffic, encouraging GPs to prescribe cycling with patients able to access bikes through their local surgery. Well, I don't know how many surgeries have got space to store a load of bikes. I'm not sure that one's going to work necessarily. They want to increase access to e-bikes by setting up a new national e-bike programme to help those who are older have to travel further or who are less fit. And they've published new higher standards for cycling infrastructure. Um, well, I wonder what you make of all of that. Um, if you're a cyclist, you probably think, well, whoopee, about time. Thank goodness something is happening. Um, well, Labour have resorted to type and they basically said it's too little, too late. They say many of the government's proposals were taking too long to come into effect. Now, of course, this comes after the obesity strategy was launched on Monday. So there is a bit of a dovetail here, may possibly a little bit of joined up government. Who would have thought? So I want to know what you think of this. Two billion pounds to be spent on cycling. Is that value for money? Is that exactly what the government should be doing? Because we are quite a way behind some other European countries in the development of cycling facilities in this country. Uh, we'll take get your calls in a moment, 0345 6060 973. But first, let's talk to Carlton Reid, who's transport contributor for Forbes.com and author of Roads Were Not Built for Cars. Were they not, Carlton? Historically, absolutely not. Good evening, Ian. Good evening. Um, well, surely they, they, they were actually... Well, I mean, OK, they were built for horses and carts initially... But, I mean, people think that cars are pr the primary road users now. That's not to say, obviously, that other things can't use roads. But um, I, there are a lot of people, a lot of car owners now, thinking effectively they're being driven off the roads in towns and cities. <laughs> well, they may think that, but there's 260,000 miles of roads in uh, Great Britain. And we're, we're talking with the money that uh, Boris Johnson and his sidekick, uh, Andrew Gilligan, have announced. Uh, we'll, we'll hardly will pay for, well, uh, maybe a thousand. So we're talking a tiny fraction of roads in the UK are, are going to get these makeovers. Maybe. We don't know if it's going to happen because with all things, with, with, with governments of all uh, creeds and colours, we actually have to see it actually happening before we can really, really comment. Do you think that in the future, essentially, cars are not going to be in city centres in particular? Maybe town centres are, are different, but in big cities, the long term aim is to drive cars out of city centres. That's happening everywhere. So I yeah, live exactly. in Newcastle, and that's that's absolutely been the plan for the last 20 years. Most cities, of, well, in effect, you've got to do this because cars are wide, uh, roads are not. You can't keep on expanding the roads. So something's got to give. Buses, uh, trams, uh, underground, all forms of mass transport, uh, and I would include uh, cycling and walking in that, are just much more efficient users of, of road space. So it just makes absolute well, sense to prioritise those users. They are for people who live either in city centres or close to city centres. But take, for example, where, where I live in Norfolk. I mean, Norwich city centre would die if people from all over Norfolk weren't allowed to drive into it uh, and park their cars. Now, there, there are park-and-ride schemes, uh, absolutely. Um, but... 
I mean, you, you can't, if you, if you live 20 miles from Norwich and you want to go and do a sort of big monthly shop, you kind of do need to take your car into the city centre. Uh, and yet uh, it sounds as if you think that that shouldn't be allowed to happen in future. Well, I don't disagree that it's, uh, it's uh, for, I used to live in Norfolk too, I used to live in Norwich too. Did you really? And, it, and it's a it's medieval... Norwich programme tonight, we've had Absolutely. a call in Norwich as well. <laughs> it's, it's a medieval city. And medieval cities, as you were intimating before, well, they weren't actually designed, streets weren't designed for horses and carts. In fact, they were designed for people. So all mm. cities were designed for people, not for the, the vehicles that came later. But cars cannot get through uh, Norwich. And Norwich was actually one of the first cities that had pedestrianisation in the 1960s. So more and more of that will come. So Norwich led the way, and I believe more and more cities will, will absolutely take uh, heed of that. And, and, and cities around the world, this is not an English, British, UK thing. This is around the world. Paris, I was there last week, is leading the way, uh, creating tons of, of, of space for uh, non-motorists. And what we've got to recognise is that motorists, we, we assume motoring is the default method for using roads. Not every single person in this country owns a car. Not every single person in this country can drive. It's maybe 60% of people in some areas of London, you know, motorists are down to 30% of the population. So we're, we're, we're talking about rebalancing and here. How, how, an what proportion of the population cycle regularly? Uh, right now, it's a different in different places. So in some parts of Hackney, for instance, it's like 15, 20%. Cambridge, it's uh, 30%. So there are pockets of very, very high bicycle usage, which just goes to show that if we actually cater for cyclists, we will get that usage. It's 2% in the whole of the UK, though, isn't it? So what we're... What, if across what, the whole of the UK, it's about... Yeah. It's, it's, it's rising... Which we can, bo it, it, which we can both agree it ought to rise. I mean, I, 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 I hope I'm not coming across as somebody who's anti-cycling. I'm absolutely not. And I do use Boris bikes myself in London. Mm. So, um, But I, I, there's got to be a balance here, I think. And, and, and sometimes cycling campaigners, um, not you, but some that I've talked to on the programme, come across as absolute zealots, sort of every car off the street... We've all got to cycle, which, I mean, is a point of view. Um, but there's got to be a mix. Now, let me ask you this. If Boris Johnson sacked Andrew Gilligan tomorrow as his cycling advisor and you got the job, what would, <laughs> what would be your first priority? Uh, Reappoint Andrew Gilligan. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Andrew, I mean, I don't believe in his politics, uh, but absolutely I believe in what he's doing here. He's doing some great stuff. And I said on Forbes... Um, in December, that I believe that with the, the re-election of, of Boris Johnson, that in this, and especially with the, the, the majority he got in the five-year fixed-term parliament, then he has a, a, a chance to actually make differences on all sorts of different levels. And by appointing Andrew Gilligan, that pretty much said one of the things he's going to be doing is reshaping cities. And with that majority, with that length of uh, term of office... He has a good chance, and Andrew Gilligan is absolutely the right person for the job. Well, that wasn't what I was expecting you to say, but let me let me put it a different way, though. Obviously, anybody who is a campaigner for a particular uh, sector will maybe welcome something that the government's done, but they will always wish that they'd gone further. What's the one thing that you would do to just take this a stage further? Well, critically, we've now got political leadership. That's always essential uh, in any rechanging of, of society. You've got to have the buy-in from the top. And, and here we have absolutely got the buy-in from the very, very top. Uh, we know he's a transport, Boris is a, a transportation cyclist, of course. I would say the other thing you've got to have is the moolah, the cash. So this promise, I know people are saying, oh, my God, it's £2 billion. Pounds. That's actually nothing compared to what's been spent on on roads, uh, for instance. So the £2 billion has got to be a starter, really, because if, if it, they really want to promise thousands of miles of cycleways, which cost £1.45 uh, million pounds per kilometre, and you want thousands, then you've got to have multi-billion pound okay. budgets. So more money, basically. Uh, Carl on Twitter says, Ian Dale's having a literal Alan Partridge moment chatting about the pedestrianisation of Norwich City Centre. <laughs> and uh, Carlton, I think I can speak for you.